Now that the government have finally admitted that we are actually in recession, I thought it might be valuable to look at the whole idea of moving from the take it or leave it negotiation, if you can call it that, into, if you like, fair share negotiation, whereby a concession given receives a concession of equivalent value in return. Now this has all arisen obviously through this build up to recession causing price pressures, if you like, on each party. At the same time, buyer churn has emerged, whereby buyers have left in the job for no more than 12 months, resulting in short-termism that's actually affected the whole relationship. In the meantime, the value of money, and cash particularly, has risen, which means naturally buyers and retailers want more for it. Hence, as I say, in extreme cases, this take it or leave it attitude has emerged in order to, if you like, get that all happening a lot faster. What we want to do is help you get back to that idea of fair share negotiation. This is how we'll do it. In the process, what we'll do is look at, first of all, how retailers have actually reacted to the recession, obviously, and the, some of the pressures as far as the uh, suppliers are concerned. We'll also look at government intervention and the possibility and how this will be implemented. We look at the rules of engagement arising, the criteria for a profitable relationship as a basis in turn for fair share negotiation out of that will come an action plan, a way forward for you. Now in terms of retailers' reaction to the recession, first of all, basically there's been pressure built up on these guys to maintain or even increase the historic levels of, if you like, return on capital they've achieved in the past. There we get talking about the idea of, let us say, 15 or even 20% return on invested capital within the business this will then in turn drive the share price and keep them free or autonomous in terms of, as I say, running their own business. Now, what they will naturally do by inclination is attempt to push costs back up the supply chain. And the easiest ways of doing that are, first of all, to go for extended credit. They will attempt cost price reductions and at the same time, in many cases, look for actual contributions to price fighting funds. If you like, all on a take it or leave it basis with no prisoners taken. And this should be no surprise to you guys who are battled hardened because of years of dealing in this way. Now, in terms of supplier reaction to the demands, obviously the big guys can actually look after themselves. I'm more concerned about the medium and smaller players who fear that a refusal could result in a loss of more than 20% of their business. In which case, obviously retailers should not interpret the lack of resistance as agreement. In fact, a really good retailer knows that if they conduct a take it or leave it negotiation then they run the risk of incurring extra costs but every time a supplier leaves a buyer's office they're determined then to get even because they cannot afford to get mad. This is not good for either buyer or seller in the long term. Now as far as government intervention is concerned, generally speaking there's no political mileage in a government entering into the supplier-retailer relationship on credit given that the overall result is lower prices on shelf for the obvious conclusion. Okay. However, there's one idea emerging whereby perhaps a blanket rule nationally of 10 days credit might have some political gain. So we need to obviously factor this into our thinking, knowing the cost of what a retailer will inevitably ask in return. They're not going to simply go back from 30 days to 10 days and not feel the need to ask for an equivalent concession return. After all, the status quo idea works in both ways. Now, governments generally uh, intervening is not the answer in terms of these business relationships, as you know. In fact, the code of practice is merely a belated acknowledgement of breakdown rather than a basis or is ever intended as a basis for compliance. Okay. In fact, it's unnecessary when common sense commercial rules govern the relationship. 
based on, if you like, a balance of need satisfaction and compromise to find a better fit between the two parties. Okay? What you end up with, or should end up with, is a legally robust agreement, obviously, not as a basis for legal action. Legal action is simply a way of dissolving a broken relationship and should not be considered as a way of ensuring compliance. Now, in attempting to establish rules of engagement between the two parties, obviously any significant market change gives us an opportunity to, if you like, reassess the whole relationship. It allows us to re-establish the fundamentals in terms of dealing on a give-and-take basis with that trading partner. Rules of engagement, in fact, reflect a fair balance of risk and reward calculated by each party and are used as a reference point on which to base any subsequent negotiation. Where we have willing, if you like, compliance on either side, then you don't have that additional cost of ensuring that the other guys do what they're meant to do following the deal. Basically, it becomes a sufficient basis for, as I say, protection of rights within that relationship by each party. Now, in terms of how this should all work out in practice, buyers obviously have become very adept at demanding, if you like, and measuring value in the relationship, particularly with, by comparison with alternatives available on the market. On the other hand, the supplier needs guarantees by way of a joint agreement, whereby they can, as I say, invest more in the relationship. Both parties need to honour obviously the letter and spirit of that agreement if you like and that becomes a basis for win-win a secure investment of time effort resource etc by each party negotiation integrates that offering with the customer adjusting for fit through a little give and take on each side and in fact it becomes a series of compromises by each party all within the base deal the status quo. Now, in order to have a fair basis for, if you like, fair share negotiation, we need to have a matching of give and take, and in other words, a concession exchange of equal value between the parties. Obviously, this is based in turn on a preservation of the balance of power and mutual need within a zero-sum game. In fact, anything less than that is an abuse of the rights of the other party. In other words, a one-sided demand for extra credit results in a win-lose situation unless a concession of equivalent value is given in return. Now, I hope it's obvious that we should not allow all of this to become a game restricted to the big guys only. In fact, as I say, become a shop that is closed to medium and smaller players, where a giant replaces joint in a joint business plan. Small players bring flexibility, innovation, can meet the needs of the retailer more precisely, whilst medium players can combine the advantages of dealing at the top end and lower end of the spectrum in terms of size. None of us ever forget for very long that a seller's need to sell is always far greater than the buyer's need to buy, and that ultimately the only way forward is via a mutually agreed fair share rules, as I say, that optimise the relationship between the two parties in spite of the economic turmoil. Finally, as far as action is concerned, we obviously have to measure all aspects of the trading relationship in financial terms. In other words, we need to know the size of the ballpark in order to stay in the game. We need to check our relative appeal and the appeal of our offering versus the competition through the eyes of the buying organisation. We need to then clarify for our own organisation particularly, but also for the retailer, our walkaway points, our limits in terms of giving and what we would want in return. We need to establish and agree the status quo for the whole trading relationship going forward recognizing that the future is in, if you like, fair share negotiation, in fact, almost win-win. Nothing is perfect. Now, this is just the tip of our iceberg, and if you'd like more, just contact us. Thank you very much indeed.